Rich, you'd call the roll, please. Mayor Owen? Here. Vice Mayor Coloni? Here. Commissioner Sachs? Here. Commissioner McGurk? Here. And Commissioner Hartman will be late. Yeah. Thank you. All right, first item up is public participation. Any members of the public wish to speak today? Seeing none, move on to the budget workshop. First item up is uh, the fire department. You're up, Chief. Well, good evening. We're back again, trying to set our goals for uh, the upcoming year. Uh, the fire department. Uh, it's not looking at any major um, organizational changes in the coming year. Uh, thankfully, we're uh, through your support. We've been able to kind of get to the to the threshold that we need to be at uh, with the added uh, benefit of transport. Uh, the we're going to kind of hold the line on on organizational uh, movement, and thusly, uh, we won't be seeking any firefighters this year at all. Uh, no additional firefighter positions with the exception of an administrative assistant for the fire marshal's office, which I'll describe to you later tonight. Uh, the fire department is divided into three different, separate divisions. We have fire and EMS services. Uh, that's the bulk of the, of the traditional fire department. We provide EMS transport, which has been um, segmented into a new, a new division. Uh, that way we can track the uh, expenditures and the revenue better. And emergency management, which is not really a... Uh, not a big budgetary item for us, but it does have a division that does create some budget concerns. As far as measurables, we uh, we trans or we responded to 5,400 calls last year, uh, zero fire fatalities, and you guys have seen these numbers before. And uh, we transported 1,400 people to the hospital through the uh, tr care transport agreement. The care transport agreement has actually been an, a major enhancement to the uh, service here in New Smyrna Beach. Uh, we, revenue. On the revenue side of the house, we created four hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollars last year. Our expected expenses are, at, are right at four hundred, so we're we're in the black on that. And you've actually provided a better, more local service for the uh, transport of people to the sick and injured to the hospital. Um, I presented to you uh, the strategic outlook for twenty twenty. Uh, if you've read through it, some of these strategic initiatives or issues are already in there. Uh, some being traffic concerns, uh, annexation, expansion, things of that nature. Uh, we also have a training a training initiative that we want to bring forward, and uh, we, we've already discussed that in previous meetings, but uh, we'll continue to be pushing that um, mission to bring a local training center to New Smyrna. Uh, over the, the last year, um, we have, we've done several accomplishments. We've partnered with uh, Division of Forestry to make sure that, that the open land clearing and burning that was happening out in Venetian Bay uh, is all but stopped. Uh, we took over the, that part of the, the license, or the, uh, I'm sorry, losing the term, uh, the authorization for open burning. Uh, we've taken that over and have eliminated the burning from land clearing for you know, large construction projects, which has really helped the uh, the health and the, the welfare of the people who live close to those uh, areas. Uh, we provided uh, federal training to seven, seven other county agencies, uh, fire departments. Uh, purchased and deployed a fire boat with your support. Uh, that fire boat's actually been used a couple times this year already, thankfully. Uh, so we do have a, uh, we, we have shown a, a need already, which is a, which is a great benefit to the, to the people. And we are the only ones on the entire east coast of Volusia County has a boat presently that's capable of doing um, environmental response, fire response, uh, search and rescue response. All right. For the coming year, uh, the same goals we presented at the beginning of this uh, strategic year, uh, just continue to uh, excel at our EMS and fire response. We're gonna do some increased training. Uh, we'd like to bring the federal, uh, some more federal training in, not only for the fire department, but for all the city departments to ensure that our disaster preparedness is where, where it needs to be. Um, it has two, uh, two distinct functions, one being our response is appropriate for the people that need it, and secondly, when we go to seek reimbursement, that we are able to reimburse from, or seek reimbursement from FEMA at the level that, that we're expecting to get that back from. And there are a lot of nuances that we've recognized over the years that have to be um, checked off to get those reimbursements at, at, near, at or near 100%. All right, now we're talking about capital. 
Uh, so I have 10 items in capital uh, this year. A large handful of them are impact fee items. Uh, but I'm going to start and go through them just one by one real quickly, uh, and then we can discuss as, if we need to. All right. The uh, apparatus bay doors at, at some of our fire stations are not hurricane rated. They're, they're on standard commercial hardware. There's nothing that different, differentiates some of our apparatus bay doors from what you would have in, your, in a regular you know, two-bedroom two home. There's not a uh, considerable difference on some of the mechanisms and the, and the construction of it. To that end, uh, we, when, a storm or, and when a storm comes that we, have to, that we have lead time on, we're required to put, or we're, we're obliged to put up hurricane curtains. Hurricane curtains are designed for commercial properties that have uh, lead time but don't have any obligation to respond during the wind event. So if I were a body shop or I were a, or something like that, the hur this hurricane curtain right here would make sense because I could put it up a day or two before the storm came. The goal of the fire department is to respond to calls till the very last minute when we shut down all operations. That threshold is 45 miles an hour of sustained winds. Obviously, you can see that the issue with us waiting till that 45, mi 45 mile an hour mark to apply curtains of that size on ladders as demonstrated there. So my objective is to upgrade the essential bay doors that, that we are required to respond out of uh, get, them get them at the hurricane rate and they need to be so that we're not required to put up these curtains at the, the very last minute. And that project is not a one-year project. It can be a two-year project. So if we need to break it up for financial reasons, we can definitely spread it out over in phases. Uh, fire engine replacement. I was uh, proposing that we actually go forward into the 2022 and seek an engine replacement program. Uh, but Garrett McCafferty from Fleet has has recommended that we go one year earlier than I had even anticipated. The, uh, the, the average pumper right now, the way we get them constructed is about $550,000 with some uh, ex extra equipment that we are required to have. Uh, we do have three options that we can pursue. One is to just buy it outright. The other option we have is to do like we did uh, four years ago with a 10-year uh, loan, low interest loan. At that cost, it would be about 57000 a year. For that, or or we could actually delay the purchase of this truck for an, an additional three years and set aside one third of that money for over the next three years. When you consider that as an option, remember that the truck actually takes almost a year to construct. So you're looking at three years plus a year, depending on how the assembly lines are running that day or that that time of year. We are replacing an 18-year-old fire engine right now with the, with the new pumper that I'm proposing. Hydraulic rescue tools, we have a variety of uh, rescue tools. Some are in the 1990s. Some are as new as 2013. We are meeting some significant challenges on the cutter, the hydraulic cutting side of the, of the house. The construction of new cars with boron tubing and the um, laminated beam construction they're putting in there. Some of our cutters won't even cut modern cars that we have. We actually have, if you go out to Waste Pro um, near the airport, we have 12 cars out there right now. And we struggled recently uh, on training cutting some of those because the cutters were not, were not substantial enough to cut a modern car. Uh, recommendation there is a, a total fleet-wide replacement of all the hydraulic tools with the ones presented there. Uh, again, that's another program that could be divided over a two-year period to soften the blow. Reserve ambulance, this is one of the impact feed items I spoke about. We are running one ambulance and one ambulance only. We do not have a backup to, to move into. If we were to have a catastrophic failure today, we would have to either rent one from a company that would be willing to rent us one out of Sanford, or we would borrow one from Edgewater. Uh, obviously, borrowing a vehicle from Edgewater is not the ideal place that we want to be as a, as a fire department that is in that is in uh, the transport business. So uh, again, this is an impact fee item. This item doesn't even have to wait until the fiscal year to be considered. It being impact fee, we could actually move it ahead of the October uh, normal budgetary cycle. Uh, Lucas CPR device, 
um, if you look at the part, the uh, bar graph on the right, you'll notice a significant return on uh, return of spontaneous circulation. That is, people who have whose heartbeat was not beating, and they actually achieved circulation through uh, CPR or through mechanical CPR. That is not the device doing the work. That is people who have been saved by this device. If you look at every yellow bar on there, is a is a return of spontaneous circulation over several different clinical studies. This is another item that would likely fall under impact fees because it's new technology. It's not a service we're currently offering. Um, we would be outfitting all of our ALS, all of our ALS engines with it. Um, so it would likely fall under uh, impact fees as a, as a purchase. And that 63000 would equip every vehicle in, that we run ALS on. Breathing air cascade, we currently do not have any way to um, refill the air bottles that we use for fighting fire, for hazardous materials, for things of that nature. The, the closest cascade system we have is in Daytona. It belongs to Volusia County, and they have to, we have to seek authorization from them to down an engine to bring it to us. This is another uh, $35,000 item that could be purchased out of impact fee money because we do not have it presently. It is an enhancement of service that we provide. And this cannot be put on a fire truck as an add-on. So to, th to think that we could cram this on a fire truck somewhere isn't really ideal because you're talking about eight cylinders, um, a fill station, things like that. It would be to put it on a, on a fire truck. I've seen it done. It's a monstrosity of a fire truck, and our city's not really laid out downtown for, for long wheelbases like that. Traffic light preemption. Uh, this is a project that's been going on for probably about 10 years now. Uh, we've got a pretty good coverage uh, throughout the city. Uh, the, all the traffic lights are, are working the way they're designed. Uh, it has improved our response times, and it definitely improves the interaction with the public. Uh, the fact that we're not forced to cross through a negatively lighted intersection is of great benefit to us and to the driving public. Um, what happens essentially is that the entire traffic intersection goes all red, and then after that, the the direction of travel for the fire engine turns green, and only that direction. Uh, for example, if I were driving out towards a call near 95, every light between here and between here and 95 would turn red at all four directions, and then give the right of way to the responding fire truck. Um, obviously, you can see the, a couple of benefits to, in response time. That we have that system throughout the, the city, except for those three that are listed on there: Corbin Park or Colony Park. I'm sorry. Colony Park, Old Mission, and Enterprise. Those are the three that do not have the hardware in the uh, traffic control cabinets. This is another item that may fall under transportation impact fees as a, uh, as a revenue source or as a funding source. Automatic external defibrillators. This is kind of, a, uh, kind of trying to fill the gap on EMS service that we have. Uh, we have several staff chiefs that are all paramedics. Um, they're all... They were all good paramedics at one time. <laughs> They've been on behind the desk a little bit longer than maybe they should have. Uh, but this would allow us to carry uh, AEDs in every staff car that we have. Uh, it would allow us to defibrillate somebody um, on the side of the road or in a store. Um, I actually used one of these that we pulled off a wall, just like you would a fire extinguisher. Uh, pulled off a wall at a dialysis center, and I used one to shock somebody probably about two months ago. And he's actually saved him, believe it or not. So... That's a uh, $12,000 purchase. I would equip five vehicles, uh, which are all staff cars. Obviously, the fire trucks are equipped with a, a defibrillator more substantial than these that have greater capabilities. This would only do the four staff cars in the tower. Lobby security. Uh, all four of our firehouses have single pane glass in the, uh, the talk through window that's there. It's sliding, it's two piece sliding glass. It's all eighth of an inch thick, probably. It's just glass. There's nothing that prevents the public from either, A, sliding the glass open and crawling through the window. Um, it also, there's nothing to prevent them from throwing something through the glass or getting handgun out and shooting through that. Um, I'm not looking for a substantial security barrier here. I'm talking about level three, which would stop a handgun or a, uh, you know, throw an object, a brick, or whatever else they may bring in with them. And that would, that would apply to all four stations. Uh, the training facility that we talked about at the Waste Pro site has now been reconsidered. We're looking at Station 51 behind Walmart. 
Um, following the strategic planning uh, session we had with the consultants, there was a lot of discussion about westward expansion and that being starting to become a greater need out there. And when you're looking at putting, trying to put a training center as central as possible, the airport is no, is no more or less central than the existing Station 51. And as the westward area grows with population, the training center will be more central to the population percentage than the airport ever would. So we're uh, considering reconstructing that, or constructing a training facility out there. One of the value-added benefits of doing that is when I add the 2,700-square-foot classroom to the other side of the fire station, that can serve as a community room, a training classroom, and also operate as an EOC, Emergency Operations Center, overflow, uh, dormitory, meeting space, whatever we need. Uh, you gentlemen who have been out there during a, a actual hurricane activation, you saw the bodies that were kind of milling around and how people were kind of stacked on each other. Uh, we have no dormitory space at all for anybody out there. Um, so people are sleeping in air mattresses in the hallways and sleeping in recliners. Uh, that classroom would no longer become a classroom during the activation. It would become a, a, a dormitory that we could cut into three pieces and, and allow for, you know, 30, 40 people to sleep in if we needed to. So that's an, that's an enhancement to not only the training side, but also the emergency operations side. And that, too, is also funded out of impact fees. Uh, looking to add one ad additional administrative staff. This is uh, kind of key to the fire prevention side of the house, our fire prevention, our fire inspection practice. Uh, we currently have one fire marshal and one inspector. This person would help streamline the processes immensely. The, the intake of phone calls and scheduling would go through, through this person, um, as well as receiving um, all of the inspections that the engine companies are doing, the, uh, the annuals, the, anything that relates to business tax receipts and the building department. This position could be uh, funded at about 50% through the building fund, as, w as well as the uh, fire department fund. And that is all I have for the capital items for this coming year. I'm open for any questions. All right. Thank you for that presentation. Um, questions, comments from the commission? Just a handful, Mr. Sachs. Mayor. Go ahead. Chief, the uh, retrofitting of the bay doors yes, for sir. hurricanes, mm -hmm. is it possible to consider um, enhancing or enforcing the current uh, doors that you have? Well, each fire station is, was built at a different time by a different contractor. So unfortunately, to, to say yes or no to, to any one project, no, um, they would all have to be considered. There, there, are, there are enhancements that could be made, but if you, were, if you look at the hardware that is in Station 50, for example, it is just garage door hardware. Mm -hmm. So to, to say that we could put a hurricane-rated door on there is probably is highly unlikely that they would, that they would be willing to to sign their name to that. So. You're satisfied with the curtain? What's that? You're satisfied with the They're curtain? They're satisfied with the curtain? Are you? Uh, I'm satisfied yeah. with, with the curtain as as it functions, but the deployment of it is, is horrible. The fact that we have to do it in, in. And the other thing is that that's a predictable event. If a tornado or some event comes through uh, unannounced, then upgraded rated doors are already in place. When a tornado or even a, even a you know, summer storm come, we'd, we're not putting those up. So by, in, by enhancing or upgrading the existing bay doors to something that is rated, you actually now allow for, you know, year-round protection of, the, of that apparatus and the, and the response that the bay doors allow for. Yes. Um, and the other question I had was the cascade filling system. Mm -hmm. That requires its own vehicle? It would require its own vehicle to, to be towed behind, but we do have oh, we, we do have a cache of a cache of uh, of vehicles. Yeah, it is a trailer. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Thanks. And I certainly wouldn't want to do it any other way. To to maintain a gasoline powered vehicle with tires and brakes and everything else is just it's problematic. Thanks. Okay. I'm in full support of whatever you guys need. Other questions or comments, Commissioner McGurk. Thank you, Chief. Um, Question about the reserve ambulance. Would it function as simply a reserve, or would we be activating that second unit to do transport? Where are we at with it in so terms of? 
presently in the current in the current agreement we have, we cannot operate a contingency transport ambulance. Meaning, I can't put it at station 51, for example, and then turn it on when I want to, or turn it on when they need it. It is. It would only be a reserve ambulance for. Um, or if we have a mechanical failure, it can be activated for special events and things like that, but e even for, for storms. But we cannot use it under the current agreement, which we're negotiating. Uh, it cannot be just turned on and off. Deltona is in the same boat we are. They're wanting to staff an ambulance when they have the available staffing, and uh, Volusia County is not really allowing that to, to take place. So do we have enough calls to handle, to run two ambulances at a time? Because I know you're talking about a contract, but and this would serve as a reserve based on a contractual obligation. But does do we have enough calls to where we would need two ambulances, or would this just simply act as? Do you understand the I, difference I, of the question? Is I, I do understand the the question. The to to say that we that New Smyrna Beach has enough enough call volume for two ambulances, like without a doubt they do. The the kind of wild card is. Evax, uh, Volusia County EMS's cooperation with that. If they flood New Smyrna with ambulances because they can, then now our ambulances become, you know, not not even needed at all. And now you have a, a budgetary right. mismatch where you're where you're staffing a unit, and you're not transporting, creating revenue. So, a, a lot of this is contingent on how well Evac or Volusia County EMS is working that day and how well they're playing along with us. I understand. Very complicated issue. Always has been. Hopefully we can get that resolved. My next question is, you replacing the 18-year truck, mm -hmm. um, how important is it to get it replaced? It's, it's 18. Are you talking about you need to do this relatively soon because it's a maintenance nightmare, or do you have a window? Is this more, where are you at with that? Uh, like I said earlier, I, I, I was looking at doing this in, the ne in next fiscal year's uh, presentation. I wasn't even looking at a fire truck this upcoming. Um, but after having a discussion with Garrett, it, it is becoming increasingly um, problematic with that 18-year-old fire truck. It is, it, the reliability oh. on it is, is, is really low. So um, if you're asking, do we need one tomorrow, we could probably limp along. But I, I don't think waiting another two or three years is in the cards at all. Okay, thank you. Appreciate Questions, it. Vice Mayor. Uh, quite a list that you put together here. Yes, sir. I just got it, so I can't ask too many really specific questions. But you have a number of items that are fire impact fees. Yes, sir. With our anticipated fees we're going to collect, how many of these items would you be able to complete? I can complete every one of those items with the current funding. Uh, the our, our impact fee... Um, Pool right now is one one point two million dollars. Um, we make about two hundred and thirty thousand annually. Is what's projected per year on fire impact fees through new construction. Okay. So all, all, any item that I presented that, that falls under impact fee could be funded. Okay. Can you repeat that again? Clarify that numbers. Those two numbers again. I'm <laughs> sorry. One point two million dollar balance now. Two hundred thirty thousand a year annual revenue from impact fees. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mary. So we have sufficient to pay for it. Uh, we now have five times as much as we expect to get in annually, I believe, if I get yes, that sir. correct. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Approximately. Is there any reason why we should keep such a high balance in there? To keep a high balance in there, absolutely not. I would. Uh, there are there are factors that go along with uh, the use of impact fees, as I'm sure you're yes. aware. Uh, the the goal is to obviously use those funds to enhance the fire service as it provides service to the city or to the citizens. We are, through this process that I'm describing to you right now, we're looking at use, like, using a large portion of those funds to enhance service to the fire department and the city of New Smyrna. I, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, when you speak about the fire training center yes, sir. and your increasing needs out west, mm -hmm. do you foresee anything in the next year or two that might... Uh, draw down those impact fees because of the increased needs out there the only in other words should we save a little bit to do yeah. improvements out there sure so absolutely the, the the one item on my radar is something 
something, whether it's a fire station or an ambulance only station, in the Venetian Bay Airport Road corridor would be the the next big ticket item that would that would deal with westward expansion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I mean, you might want to prioritize some of the impact mm -hmm. fees money. I know I spoke to you about that, and I agree. I think that's something important that we're going to have to deal with in the future, in the not too far distant future. On the fire engine, mm -hmm. uh, I would not like to go into long term uh, financing of it. If it's a couple years out, I would just as soon uh, start putting the money away for it. Now, you said, and this is a question that probably you can't answer, sure. uh, if it takes a year to build it, can we start to encumber an expense for that, anticipating the funds in future years? If you have the funds, yes, you can. And I think we should, because that's a big ticket item. Yes, so I would like to go down that route. Yeah, yeah. Every time we go for, every time we start talking about fire truck, we're talking over half a million dollars every time. Correct. And it is an expensive process. I uh, bought them in the past elsewhere, yes, so I know. Yes. To, but my only concern, and I, to make sure I'm, I'm understanding your philosophy, I they will not start constructing a fire truck. Correct. Until we have funding in place, and we've authorized them to go. And we all and do exactly, it. exactly. So, so to, to delay it or to set aside a nest egg and then buy a fire truck, we're talking about adding another year on to the end of Correct. the maturity of that nest egg. Unless there was some other financing that we could Correct. anticipate. Correct. So I understand that. That's good. Uh, one thing, one last question, mm -hmm. is uh, you mentioned the fire boat and how it's, uh, it's showing its need right mm -hmm. now. And I know in the past I've talked to you about uh, if we do a, a plan to improve the AOB site, would there be any need to uh, make arrangements to move the boat out there other than to release an income generating site at the marina? Yeah, if, if an enhancement was made to the AOB site that it was a city function, then yes. obviously securing an area um, away from the city marina would be beneficial to the fire department as well as to the city marina as okay. an enterprise. All right, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Commissioner Hartman. I apologize for being late. Um, with regards to the apparatus bay doors, are the windows impact resistance that's currently in the stations? Uh, it depends on the station. Uh, station 50, no. They are 100% they are glass because we just broke one fairly recently. <laughs> so that's something we should also look at at some point in the time in the future um, for these little micro storms and things like that if we don't get to hurt the shutters up in, time, in a timely manner? That's correct. So, okay. so and there's when you talk about hurricane impact doors, I'm talking about there's two, there's several options. One being a door that is utilized day to day, but is also hurricane rated. Right. Another option is to, is a shutter uh, of sorts. Uh, the what we run into with a shutter is is you have a problem with it's not always deployed in the in the secure fashion. So if you were to get a micro storm, you would it may not be in place. Right. But if you were to fund a a door that was hurricane rated, um, then it would be in, in place at all times. Right. So. But I would also think that we'd want to look at the windows at the same time because if it's really going to be a shelter of some sort to that level, then we should look oh, at the, the house windows. Yeah, the house, house windows, windows. Are, are impact resistant. Okay, the house windows. Okay, I apologize. Okay. Um, Um, the Cascade Breathing System. Mm -hmm. What does Edgewater and Port Orange currently use, and would it be possible to maybe do a joint venture with them if the closest one is all the way up in Daytona? Um, Ed Edgewater does have a small Cascade system, but it, it's I hate just a handful of bottles, and then it's depleted. Um, in order to have a Cascade system that's you know uh, eternally sustaining the you have to have an onboard compressor and all those things which we're not even proposing here what we're what we're proposing here is a eight bottle system that can refill 60 air bottles before having to drive back to a refill station so uh, edgewater does have a small very small cascade but you can only get a handful of of bottles filled with that the uh, a joint venture is definitely something that i would be interested in considering um I know that Edgewater would definitely utilize it, so so their level of cooperation would be interesting to okay. see where they're at. All right. Um, that's all the questions I had. Thanks. Oh, okay. 
back to the impact fees. The, the, your 230 that you're receiving is only on new construction. Correct. So what happens when the market goes down 1,800 points in two days and we stop construction? There's no more impact fees, right? Yes, correct. Okay. It quits growing. That The minute that happens, it quits growing. Yep. Okay. That's it. That's it. All right, a couple, couple of things for me. My colleagues hit on most of the things. Uh, Commissioner McGurk, I think, was commenting on, uh, or maybe Colody, on the um, the cliff. Like, what is if there's anything coming that, you know, in the next two to three, four years, it's kind of major, big, that isn't captured here that we should already be kind of saving for. Um, but I think the answer to that is no. It's all kind of considered here. It's all, it's all there. Um, obviously, fire truck replacement is a... Is a half a million dollars. So I was going to go to that one next, actually. So let me okay. let me just stop you there. So I, I think to to the to the point earlier is you know if we just that's a re known recurring expense. Those are going to they have a life. They're going to expire at some point. If we just we probably should be putting you know take however many we need, divide by twenty year life, and be putting that amount in a sinking fund every you know every year. So that when the time comes to buy, we just have the money there. Um, in this case, I think we could. Um, you know, we we have the we have the money. So if we to to get away from this one year lead time, if we needed to, if we needed to go ahead and commit to buying it to get it in the process of building before we fully had that you know kind of fund when you fully say, funded. When you say we have the money, you talk about in reserve. I'm, I'm saying we have cash. It's not like we don't have the. It's not like we can't. The check's not going to bounce. It's the question of the source of the funding. So, um, you know, I wouldn't want to see us to your point. I wouldn't want to see us delay. I'd like to see us maybe starting some program where we have these, we just know what's funded. Yeah, and, you know, and the magic unless, number for New Smyrna is at once every three years, because with only four stations, that gets us at the 12-year yeah. replacement mark. Uh, the manufacturers will not sell me one-third of a fire truck each year, though. I've already asked. Hmm. So we have, to, we have to buy it one. Yeah, right. Um, so I guess my the only question I had that wasn't touched on already was this, this notion that... Um, the, the impact of annexations, and you mentioned expansions, but that, that one's a little more self-explanatory. But help me understand, because we're, as you know, we're pushing annexations at this point. Um, to me, it's a more efficient model. But help me understand how it impacts you all and what future, you know, if, if we, you know, if overnight all of a sudden, you know, half of the homes that weren't annexed today were annexed, what would that mean to you from an impact standpoint? What would you be in front of us asking for to address that? The only, we're, us being in, already know, covering that area. Graphically locked like we are. Yeah. The only area of, of real concern on my radar is out west. We're not growing, we're not growing anywhere east of 95. Yeah, it's, it's already built out. So, 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 point, so if we annex in, so let's take Corbin Park. It's kind of a smattering of of of, uh, of city and county. So if that were a hundred percent city, you wouldn't be back here saying, "Well, now I need another station or another fire truck because now I've got those extra two hundred homes in Corbin Park." We already kind of have the coverage for that, right? We have the staff and the coverage for that. That's correct. That? And because because we have a closest unit response agreement with Volusia County, right. um, any EMS call, any fire. Gets a gets whatever closest unit is there. Yeah. Uh, so presently, if you want to talk about Corbin Park, we are the Corbin Park Fire Department. Yeah. For every house there. Yeah. So. Okay. We can talk more on that, but that's that's uh, that's interesting. So. Excellent. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I have one more, most additional comment. Okay. Some of you may have heard it before, and I will gladly speak about it again. Traffic lights for fire stations. It is most essential, and I'm sure you would agree, Chief, that it is best practices to use them, considering the traffic we have on 3rd Avenue and 44. We have the funding for the traffic light at 52. Apparently, the, I'm sorry, the traffic light at 50. Mm -hmm. At 52, it is still at the TPO for a feasibility study. I have warrants and copies of them, if anybody wants to see them, from the county, and FDOT, that they meet the warrants for traffic lights at those stations as standalone features. And I just want to reiterate for Brian, these are standalone features. We should not wait, and I'm, speak, I'm looking at you while I'm speaking, I should be speaking to staff because that feature at 52 should be in place as soon as we can. I know it was said that we might wait till a hotel is built 
they have considerations, they have roadway <laughs> constraints as well. But I feel if we build the traffic light for Station 52 and it be retrofitted as a normal traffic light for the traffic that may come out of a supposed hotel, which we have no idea which will be when or if it will be even built, that we need to consider the building of that in the next budget post haste. So I just want to share that with my colleagues. Um, I know it's sitting in uh, TPO for feasibility study since 2015, gentlemen. We've waited on a traffic light, and that's inexcusable. It, it's a disservice to the public. And, and I have to stress again, we need to get both those lights. I appreciate we got one. Let's go ahead and get two, okay? That's okay. all I have. Thank you, Chief. Uh, so, since he brought that up, is there any way to use a preemptive device to activate the two traffic lights for 50 or 52 if we use a remote receiver closer to the fire stations. I know that at Station 11 in Orlando, because of the road configuration and the traffic, the actual receiving device was almost four blocks away from the Correct. intersection, Correct. which changed the light to allow the traffic to flow so they could even get to the intersection. Mm -hmm. So is that something that we've looked at or? Uh, not only have we looked at, we actually employ it at 52. So at 52, we actually have control of the light at Saxon and we have control of the light at Peninsula. And what that does is it, is it creates a box for us to, to work in. Um, obviously, there's infill from, right. from other roads that you can't control. But that we do, we are able to build a box when we respond by controlling Saxon and, and um, Peninsula okay. at 3rd Avenue. So, so that is definitely an option. Uh, some of the interactions that we have problems with, obviously, are, are um, the commercial traffic from Dunkin' Donuts and things like that. Um, and obviously, the infill. Right. the infill from the unregulated un, uh, streets. All right. Gentlemen, I want to make sure we leave enough time for the, for the other public safety. We can, uh, I think, on the agenda at the next meeting, we have some TPO discussions, so we can certainly come back to this if needed then. So thank you, Chief. Really appreciate all you all do. Everyone can hum the Titanic theme as you leave. <laughs> Still laughing about that. All right. Chief. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, I'm going to zip through some of our presentation. Um, but before I get started, uh, I've been doing this work, public safety work, for I'm in my 33, 33rd year coming up here in just a couple of months. I've worked at the largest law enforcement agency in this county. Uh, I've been the public protection director for uh, the county, which includes fire services, and I will tell you, after five years of being here in New Smyrna, uh, the public safety services that are being offered here are second to none anywhere in this county. Uh, our relationship with our brothers and sisters in the fire department is as good as anywhere. Uh, we train together. Uh, I've seen what, what they can do and what the men and women in this room that are wearing blue can do. And it just doesn't get any better. Uh, I'm very proud to be associated with, with both of these agencies. Um, so with that, I'm going to get right into our presentation. Uh, real quickly, uh, I'm not going to dwell on our uh, accomplishments here in, in 2019. I'm going to point out a few of these. Uh, specifically, the second one, where our officers are trained in tactical combat casualty care, uh, de-escalation techniques, autism awareness, and crisis intervention. That's 100%. Uh, there's not another agency around that, that, that can claim that. Um, that's just like there's not another agency anywhere around here that is 100% uh, compliant with body cameras. Transparency in this business, in the police business right now, is at the very top of what we should be offering our citizens. Uh, we need to be transparent in terms of what we do uh, and our ability to listen to what our, our citizens are asking of us. Uh, and, and again, uh, I'm very proud of the fact from the chief on down to the brand new officers, and there are, there are four of them sitting right there, uh, that we are 100% compliant with, with all of this. Uh, again, this isn't something that anybody else does. Um, derelict vessel removal, um, we did pretty well last year. We, we got a, a vessel out of here. Um, already this year, we've gotten two more vessels out. Uh, we're working with our partners at the Florida Wildlife Commission uh, to ensure that we're going to get the rest of those out. Um, I don't know how this other boat burned up the other day, but, you know, I don't know if that was part of that or not. 
Um, we are also 100% uh, in our ability to uh, deliver naloxone to those patients that need it. We have several saves so far. We, that is funded through grant monies, um, and we have just re-upped that grant, and we will continue to have every officer carrying uh, naloxone. Um, our Special Law Enforcement Trust Fund, uh, we fund the SOTUS program through that. Uh, it's $5,000 that we use to um, create a partnership with our faith-based community uh, to support the SOTUS program. We also use it for DNA analysis on our cold case homicides. Uh, that's really where the bulk of our Special Law Enforcement Trust Fund uh, money goes. Uh, as you might remember, uh, last year, um, 2018, uh, we uh, completed an investigation, which um, I was talking with uh, one of our lead investigators on, on that case today. Uh, we're about to wrap up uh, the sentencing in that, that case where we were able to close a 27-year-old homicide. Uh, again, this is not commonplace in, in, in law enforcement. This is through the, the hard work and diligence of, of the people that you see right here in this room uh, doing a fabulous job. Our parking staff, which is part of the police department, uh, as you can see here, generated quite a bit of, of uh, revenue for the city, uh, $156,000 and, and change on uh, citations, and then $1.184 million in kiosk revenue. As well as our code enforcement, um, you know, the code enforcement folks uh, don't get a lot of a, a positive pat on the back. But again, they're some of the most hardest working folks that we have in, in the agency. I mean, these are folks that are out there chasing down everything from people, you know, feeding nuisance animals to signs on the side of the road. These are the folks that make our city what we want to present out there. Uh, and, and they're doing a fabulous job. We asked them to focus on the US-1 corridor this past year, and I think they've done a great job in, in making some strides and, and bringing some businesses uh, up to code. And also, what's more important than that is they do it most times without the need for a citation. What we've asked them to do is to work towards compliance rather than enforcement. Uh, that has worked out very, very well for us in, in the past. Uh, as we move into our 2020 goals, uh, I'll just touch on, on a few of these. Um, our joint training center with the Port Orange Police Department is scheduled for uh, opening within the next 60 days. I expect to have a, a grand opening uh, within that time frame. I was speaking with them just yesterday. so. Um, that is, a, is the joint venture that we used for, uh, with impact fee money. Uh, our contribution uh, as a one-third partner was $800,000. Port Orange came up with, with the bulk of that. And then we share that resource. <clears throat> What's good about that for us here in New Smyrna is we, in the past, have, seen, have uh, received a lot of noise complaints for our, especially our weekend shooting at our airport range. Well, that will all go away. Uh, we will close that facility and then turn that back over to the airport, and those noise complaints will be a thing of the past. I'll we'll talk about the service delivery improvements here in just a minute with the community services officers. Um, and then again, uh, our recruitment, retention, and, and uh, our sponsorships. As we stand here right this minute, we have six unfilled positions in the police department. And I'll break that down for you here in just a second. Um, we have three that are in process. Um, uh, one is a, a uh, student that's already in uh, the academy and should be graduating pretty soon, and two of them have just started the academy. Uh, all three of those are females, um, and we're always looking to increase the diversity of this agency. Again, this is something that when I came in here in 2015, it was a priority of mine, and it continues to be a priority. We're making some strides, but we're not where I want to be yet. Okay, well, we're going to get to some, some meat of this. Every police department across the country is, is currently measured on uniform crime reports. This is our five-year total crime index on the uniform crime reports. The crime index are your eight top crimes that every agency is, is measured by because they're the same everywhere. They're also the most um, accurately reported. Uh, they include murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault for your person's crimes, and then burglary larceny, which in this case is theft, uh, motor vehicle theft, and arson. So every agency across the country is, is measured on these crimes, and um, what you see here is a, is a trend down for us. Again, uh, the, I, I'm not going to take a lot of credit for this. These folks here in the room are, are, are the ones that do this. And, and just to give you an idea, uh, and I'm going to use some of these comparisons in just a, a little bit, in, um, 
2018, which is the last year, the, uh, the 2019 stats aren't out yet. I can tell you what ours are, but I don't know what the other agencies are because they haven't been published. But, I mean, they run the gamut from Daytona Beach Police Department at, at the highest is a 41-22, 4,122. And here we are sitting here right now at, at 629. Um, Ormond Beach at 1498. Deland at 1438. Port Orange at 1422. It just gives you a, a, an idea in, in comparison of, of what we think are like cities here within this county where we fall, which is extremely lower on your index crimes. Police response time. Again, this is a, a measurement that um, a lot of agencies are um, judged by. Um, for me, police respo response time is important. However, it's not the... The uh, I, I don't put as, as much stock into that as, as, as other folks do. For instance, it, on our emergency calls, our average total response time, including the uh, dispatching time, is 5 minutes and 29 seconds. Asking these officers to drive faster to these calls as a, as a way to reduce response time exponentially increases the chance that we're going to have a crash. In this city, especially on weekends, and holidays and just general beach times, you know what the traffic's like here. To ask these men and women to drive 70 and 80 miles an hour to an emergency call for service so that they can get there 20 to 30 seconds faster and take that exponentially higher chance of becoming involved in a crash that could hurt one of them or, God forbid, another citizen, for me, is not worth that extra 20 or 30 seconds. As I, so what, what, what I tell folks here is, Driving fast is dangerous. Get there in one piece. Now, I don't want them driving like your grandmother, but I also <laughs> don't want them driving like Richard Petty. So it's somewhere in, in the middle. I'm going to present an option here in just a minute that I think will help tremendously with that response time. Um, and you, when you take a look at our police calls for service, our top 10 incident types really don't change from year after year. Um, besides burglary and theft on there, as you see, which is number two, uh, as our UCR crimes, most of these are, you know, you, you read the, the report every day. You see, you see what we're doing. Most of these don't really uh, call for uh, reports. Crashes do, but, you know, your alarms, your disturbances, your miscellaneous service calls, uh, parking complaints, these are the calls that we handle on a regular basis that don't make that report. But they're constant and they're all day long. Uh, you add to that the, the trespassing, the nuisance crimes, and the, um, the mental health crimes, or mental health issues that we have out there that, that uh, involve police officers when really they, that they shouldn't. These guys and gals are busy all day and all night long. Uh, I'll show you what, what I'm talking about here in just a minute. So what we, what we did here is in, from 2015 to 2019, um, we chartered our, our annual calls for service. You see from 15, it, it spikes up in 17, and then it's kind of leveled off a little bit to where uh, what, what we think it, it's going to stay at was in that 56 to 58,000 calls a year. What did you say you had? 5,400? <laughs> 57,000 calls for service a year. <laughs> I, I'm not picking on Sean. It's just it, it, that, again, as we, we get into this and, and we talk about what that number means to us, it becomes hugely important for, for these guys and gals that are sitting over here. We have 75 authorized positions. Right now, we sit here with 69 actual bodies in those positions. Um, we're a very flat organization. If you, and uh, Chris Kirk and I were, were looking at, uh, uh, I think it was a 2007 yearbook that they had um, here, and they, they had these yearbooks. It was pretty cool. They had all the pictures of the officers now that you see when they're much older. And the, but when you look at their command structure, they had a chief, they had commanders, they had all kinds of, of, of people here. We, we're not like that. We're very flat. Um, so we're staff 100% uh, at leadership and sergeant level. Uh, the corporal position uh, was just announced. The test will be very shortly within the next, I'm hoping, 60 to 90 days. Uh, and then we're sitting at um, 37 actual officers that are here as we speak right now, including the four new folks that are sitting right there. Our support staff, I uh, cannot say enough about our support staff. Uh, Donna's back here, but, but we have um, 20, 
uh, and it's hard to, to, to put a number on this. When we say that we have 19 full-time and three part-time, that three part-time is actually six because they're 0.5. So we have six bodies there, and that's our parking uh, enforcement staff. So when you look at these folks here, come to work every day and provide a very valuable service, and they're absolutely part of our team and our family. And then we get a manpower comparative, and this is where the, those numbers become really important. What we did was we took the surrounding agencies we think are comparative to us, and we took and got rid of the... Uh, non-call taking folks, so no admin, no investigators, none of those folks. These are out in uniform call taking people at full staff. And you look at where New Smyrna Beach is. We're at 37. Port Orange at 74. You know, Ormond at 52. Deland at 55. <coughs> Daytona we put in there as, as 171 just because it's, it happens to be on this side of the county, but it's that gives you an idea of, of what the, the largest agency over on this side of the, the county is handling in, in terms of people and calls. Uh, and this is for this year. <laughs> when you look at, at the, the call for service comparative, then you see what these other agencies are, have, are, are uh, handling compared to what we are. Port Orange at 54,000 and change. Ormond at 71 and change. Uh, and you go on down the, the, the line there. I'm not going to you know, regurgitate all that for you, but what it, what it shows here is that we're handling as many calls, if not more, than some of our partners that are close by. This is really the, the most important statistic, and, and everything else was leading up to this. When you talk about the number of officers and the ratio of calls per officers, and we're going to take 2019, for example, uh, a lot of research went into this from uh, a lot of people that are sitting in this room. You can see that that because we are staffed the way we are, every officer here is handling more calls than virtually anywhere else in the county when it comes to officers per, per calls for service. In short, these guys and gals are working their butts off. Uh, they're running from call to call to call. And they're, they're doing some of the, the hardest work anywhere around here. And doing just a, a, a great job. So I'll switch to the budget. This is our, our last 10 years of our budget. And when you look from where it's kind of kind of flat, a couple dips up, a couple dips down, but the, the, the number that's important is, is, is the first number is that in 2009-2010, from there till 2019-2020 is a 5% increase over a 10-year period. Uh, costs during this time have gone way up more than 5%. So when you, when you look at our, our budget in terms of, of where we are and, and what's operating and what's capital and what's personnel, you know, personnel makes up the, the bulk of our budget, over 70% of it. We, in, in short, we are a, a, a person-driven, a, a people-driven business here. Our job is to get out and, and move around and, and contact people. So people are what, what really makes us successful. Um, I probably need some help here at some point from uh, John McKinney on this, but these are our police employee burden costs for our police pension. Um, this year we budgeted at 18.4%. Um, and based on the actuary and the uh, uh, pension board, it actually came in at 25.5%, uh, which leaves us with about a 200 and uh, $27,500 budget shortfall for our current year. Uh, we're going to have to figure that, that part out. More importantly, uh, and next year we expect that that uh, employment contribution for the city will be up to 26%. Uh, and you, you can see those numbers of, of where we are. That's, that's quite a bit more money than what we had been budgeting in the past. This total PD bur uh, burden that uh, John helped us work out, and you know, again, the partnership that, that we have with our, our friends in, in the finance department uh, can't be understated. They, uh, we call them and ask them questions all the time. Uh, we ask for their help, and uh, they do a great job in providing these numbers for us because there's no way I could do it. Um, these include an estimated, uh, we, we budgeted for a 3% merit increase. Um, 
uh, estimated insurance increases and estimated contract adjustments this does not include code enforcement uh, because we have not gotten our hands around a code enforcement budget yet. We have basically one quarter uh, where we've been able to isolate that budget, so we're kind of projecting forward uh, on what that will be uh, based on uh, past experience from the code enforcement people and what John is helping us do. Um, there's a compensation study that's in progress. Um, that needs to be completed very soon so we can budget accordingly. But I want to talk about um, where we are in terms of the, the contract adjustments. As we are a people-driven uh, agency, Sean came up here and asked you for some capital things. Uh, I'm not going to stand up here and ask you for capital things. I have one real capital item that I need, which is the um, we're coming up on our fifth year of our body cameras, and we need to re-up that. Uh, that surface uh, service, and that that's going to cost us uh, between sixty and seventy thousand dollars a year. That's a five-year contract that, that we're going to be looking at. Beyond that, it's about people. I need to be competitive with the folks that are hiring the best officers around here. I need to be competitive with Daytona and Port Orange and Ormond Beach. And right now, we are not. Uh, and you know we, we offer very good benefits. We offer some some things that other agencies don't. We're 20 years and out, and those are all nice. But when you're trying to hire and retain 20 something and 30 something officers who are trying to raise a family and who are uh, you know trying to find a home uh, to either buy or rent in this city, they can't do it on what we're paying them here. <coughs> These four guys over here, up until just this uh, past week or so. We're making ten dollars an hour. That's what we pay our interns when, when we have them in school. Um, it, it's difficult for these young men and women to to do this, uh, especially what we're asking them to do, which is go out and lay their lives on the line. And to uh, they're they're looking for support from us to to make our pay competitive. So I'm hoping that the the compensation study that's coming up will support what the union's asking for. Um, I just want to say publicly here that I'm 100% in, in support of what the, the union is looking to do. Um, I'm going to move on quickly there because I know I'm running out of time. Uh, police impact fee, I know that was a question for Sean. Uh, our current balance is one point, almost $4 uh, million. Um, when you take uh, the corporals, uh, which are vehicles, equipment, and the technology, and our drones, which were just approved, thank you very much. Uh, our projected balance as of June uh, the 1st should be about just a little over a million dollars. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, show you a couple things now that I, I think um, will, will hopefully help us. Part of what I propose in uh, our upcoming budget is uh, adding a community services officer. This is a, a position that a lot of other agencies, some here in the county have, some outside the county, it's very successful. What it does is that these are non-sworn positions, civilians that uh, we outfit and train who can handle uh, non-emergency type calls for service, non-enforcement calls for service. Uh, we handle a ton of, of calls like traffic hazards and uh, residential burglaries and thefts like bicycle thefts that occurred you know, sometimes three, four weeks ago that have no investigative leads. Um, that tie up officers, um, found property, lost property, vandalism. These are things with, with really no uh, investigative leads that, that can be followed up by a sworn officer. Uh, most people are just looking for an insurance type report. Um, these are uh, a few thousand calls that we've called out a year that, that community services officers could go handle so that the police officers can stay in service and be available <coughs> to respond to these actual emergency type calls for service. And I'm hoping that that will bring some of our response times down. A lot of where we are in response time is because we're tied up on calls. And, and some of those calls will sit for several minutes until we can break free and, and handle the other calls. Um, I'm prepared to go into as much detail as you want on the community services officer, but I put the cost for a community services officer uh, versus a police officer um, up there, the difference in the two. Um, I, I'm hoping that that's some, uh, a direction that we can go, and I'm, I'm prepared to speak with you about that individually and, and answer whatever questions you have. This presents the, um, the three-year um, personnel requests that I'd be looking for in this coming budget year would be four community services officers. 
uh, the following year, um, based on the uh, expected development out west that, that Sean was talking about and that you all know, um, that zone out there, which is uh, a very large zone in, in our 40, 41 square miles of, of city here, we need to split that zone in half. It's, it's the, the demand for service out there is such that we have uh, continually having to pull officers over to help cover some of those calls out of Venetian Bay. And as we anticipate the growth there at uh, 44 and 95, I expect those calls are going to increase. And then uh, in 22, 23, uh, looking to add two mental health victim advocates. Uh, I touched earlier upon the, uh, the number of calls, and you, you read the call log daily, uh, the number of mental health calls that we're getting for both the homeless, uh, the drug addicted, and general mental health uh, issues out there are increasing on a day-to-day -day basis. What we're able to do is to go in and conduct a Baker Act for someone who may be a danger to themselves or others, or a Marchman Act for someone who's under the influence uh, and, and can't care for themselves. But that really kind of is where it stops for us. We're able to deal with the, the issue at that moment, but then the follow-up is where we're, we're lacking right now and where we need to do a better job as a police agency. Uh, my proposal is, is we hire some mental health professionals and supplement our victim advocates in there who do an outstanding job, especially when it comes to the homeless, and trying to solve the underlying problem so that we don't repetitively have to go to the same place and deal with the same people. Um, so just to give you an idea, uh, all, three, all three of those years, the initial uh, positions with their... Uh, Uniforms and equipment and vehicles and everything, I, I'm proposing that that be uh, financed through the uh, impact fee fund, but then we would be responsible for the salaries. Uh, that's what I got. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Very, very informative, and uh, really appreciate the information. General, we've got about, I'd say, safely seven to ten minutes, really, if we want to try to grab a drink or anything before the next meeting. So, um quick questions that we have. I remind, we're not making any final decisions. This is all just kind of initial information that we can then use to have further conversations with staff. So, but any initial uh, questions or clarifications you want to ask of Chief at this time, and ask you to just keep that as brief as, as possible. And we can come back to this if needed. Commissioner McGurk. Just a brief comment, more for the, the commission, you know, and for Chief, this goes for both Chiefs, you know. I looked at the history and heard from many old timers We've never paid the people as much as the surrounding cities or other cities. But the benefit was you got to live here in New Smyrna. Now the problem is we've lost that. The fact of the matter is New Smyrna is too expensive to live in. So we don't have that benefit anymore. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> I'm not sure we can ever reach that. But to the commissioners, you know, when I talk back and, and look back in history, that was a very, very aggressive position that former commissioners took 30, 20, even 10 years ago. Um, and that has totally changed. Mental health issue, I get it. Local Stuart Marchman branch closed down. They were giving people services. We're getting a critical mass here being pushed down from, coming from the north. Loss of services. And I agree. I, I think it's fantastic that you have the programs that you have for training the officers on mental health issues and autism. And I think that, you know, what we're seeing here, we're losing resources around us and we're going to have to be able to step up and start dealing with these issues locally where historically in the past we haven't had to. And obviously pay and housing, it's a big issue in my mind at least, because historically the benefit was, hey, you got to live and grow up in this great town, but you're not necessarily going to make as much as other, pe other, other cops or firefighters in other cities. That doesn't work anymore. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Commissioner Harmon. Your, the majority of our, your call loads traffic accidents, you know, by the daily log blogs that we get. And are you looking to use the CSO to do some of those, the hit and runs where there's only one party? Okay. Yeah, when you see uh, some of our, our crashes that um, <clears throat> involve just a little bit of transfer paint where we would not be issuing a, a, a traffic citation or if someone's backing out of Publix and, and backs into a bollard or something of that, of that right. nature there, 
We typically don't issue a, a traffic citation to a single vehicle crash where there's no injuries or anything like that, and those absolutely would be handled by the CSO. Okay. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Commissioner Just Zach's. a quickie, Mr. Mayor. Chief, uh, do you foresee a traffic unit uh, motors anytime soon? I sure hope so. Um, that's really what, once we get our, our zone positions filled and the corporal position filled, those would be the first specialty positions that, that we have. We haven't had any specialty positions other than a canine since I've been here in, in the five years coming up here in March that I've been here. Um, so, again, between the, the two uh, traffic positions that, that you mentioned and the CSOs, I'm hoping to free up about 1,800 hours of regular zone units to be able to do some serious traffic enforcement. Right now, when we have a, a step assignment where we say, go down here to Magnolia and, and run some radar between these hours and these hours, they'll go do that. But the rest of the time, they're answering calls. So they don't have time for that. I appreciate that. And your officers do step back when they administer not an Arcan. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, for their own safety. They if, call if, risk. You if you haven't done that before, you haven't been around to see it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a flip of a impressive. coin how somebody's going to wake up. Yes. Do you call uh, for backup, rescue backup when you administer naloxone? Yeah, we, on any call that where it's in progress, we like to have two officers present. And again, that number, that 57,000 and change number, that's individual calls. On many of those calls, we have two and sometimes three officers responding depending on uh, what type of call it is and whether or not it's in progress or is it occurred after the fact. Thanks, Chief. I'm very happy when I see seven and eight on the roster, and I hope you can, I hope you're happier getting it up there, too. Thanks. Okay. Vice Mayor Claude, any comments, questions? No, nice presentation. Uh, I see what's coming down the road in the future, and I just want us to be prepared for it. So uh, I see some big costs coming down the road, and we really got to look into that. That's it. Be glad to see the detailed numbers. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I concur with my colleagues. Uh, Commissioner McGurk said it well. You know, I think... Um, We've got to start taking some bites at the apple, or else this is going to this is going to cause some some long term issues. And I, I think the direction we're headed, I think that you know the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, the, the the historical stats speak to the to the great job that we're doing. And so whatever we have to do to uh, ensure that we can continue that and respond to emerging trends, be that growth trends, be that um, you know demographic trends, the, the the mental health type stuff. My my only two observations, not for debate today, but just to put on your radar, would be, you know, is d can we wait till the 22, 23 for those mental health positions? I mean, I just, I, that's that's all I hear about almost. It seems like in the headlines is the policing in that space. And I know we're doing all we can with the awareness on autism and other things, but um, yeah, I know we can't do it all at once, so I appreciate you trying to spread it out. But that that is concerning uh, to me. And then the other one would be not on that same scale by any stretch, but um, you, you said it well when you talked about the code enforcement and the you know the the work that they do um, is 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 very visible, but yet it's you know they they it's very behind the scenes in some ways. Um, so, but that's not going away anytime soon either. In fact, it seems like it's kind of ramping up. It seems like we might even be building a, a backlog versus clearing a backlog. Um, and then when you think about parking enforcement, we're talking about a whole different conversation there. So, I think whatever comes out of that conversation that we have as a commission, I think just think we have to remember. We can't really lay any more on what's happening now. If we're gonna, if we want to step up enforcement, be it in parking or more code enforcement, whatever it is, I think it's going to be. Uh, we have to have you know extra personnel to approach that. Is what I'm seeing in these numbers. So, all right, those are my thoughts. If there's no closing comments, we will uh, thank you. Uh, both chiefs, really appreciate it. All the team members that were here, thank you for being here. Thank you for support. Welcome to the to the new four gentlemen. And um, with that, we will adjourn this meeting, and the next meeting will convene at 6.30 p.m. Thank you all.